Welcome to the City Forum podcast. I'm Sir Craig Mackey. I'm a City Forum associate and it's my privilege to chair this podcast. This podcast is part of the Digital Policing Summit due to take place later next month. The summit gives an opportunity to look at what's happening in digital policing and what's happened over the last 12 months as the police service has moved into new ways of working and surged forward in digital technology. This afternoon's podcast gives us the opportunity to look at what do we need to be concerned about in terms of crime and the changing demands on police in the COVID pandemic. With guests, I hope to be exploring what's happened with crime, what skills we need in the workforce going forward, what can partners and industry bring into this space to help with the challenges we face and what of the changes that we've seen are temporary and we think we'll move back from and what are those where people start to see emerging trends going forward that will be things to address for the future. And I'm fortunate this afternoon to be joined by panellists Martin Underhill, Police and Crime Commissioner for Dorset, Ms. Karen Baxter, the incoming Managing Director of Economic Crime and Intelligence Strategy at UK Finance, and Mr. Al Potter, Vice President and Managing Director for National Security and Defence Division, Lidos UK. Welcome to this afternoon's podcast. And Martin, if I begin with you, here we are some seven, eight months uh, into, into the pandemic. What, what looks and feels different in terms of what's going on on the streets of Dorset and what you're seeing around policing? Thanks, Craig. I think the biggest difference has been the changing location. So we all know, because we've lived through this extraordinary year, that the empty city centres uh, are now a part of our daily life and may never recover from COVID. Medium term, will we see town centres become new housing areas? Will shop fronts be converted to one-bedroom flats? We know the retail industry has collapsed. And equally, uh, will multi-storey car parks in town centres disappear and with them hotspots for vehicle crime? Traditional nighttime economies may never recover. We know over 60% of all beer consumed now is consumed at home. Will pubs and nightclubs remain part of our social fabric in two years' time? And with that, the nighttime economy and crime associated with it, violence and sexual offences, will that all move indoors? And talking of indoors, we know that we've seen a rise in domestic abuse and we fully expect to see a rise soon in child sexual abuse reports, especially familial abuse. As the offenders change their behaviour to suit home working and family lockdowns, this will lead to new victim behaviours and often learnt victim behaviours, which policing has to adapt to and learn from. And finally, for me, really, on this area of changing crime locations and hotspots, one idea to reach out to these confined victims is the practice policing has adopted over county lines. We know that neighbourhood policing teams across Dorset and now across England are the front line protecting vulnerable people from being cuckooed. And often they use a secret password given to the vulnerable person. So when they discreetly knock on the door every day, that person can ask for help. Maybe we should be extending that to domestic abuse and uh, child sexual abuse. I don't know. Policing is a fast moving environment at the moment, but we have to find solutions because the crime type and the crime location is moving. You touched on the changing crime patterns you're seeing and that sort of thing. What is it doing to the workforce and the skills you think you're going to need going forward? It's really interesting you talk about that because um, there are so many side effects of COVID that nobody expected. The future of policing and the public sector workforce is definitely going to be a legacy of this awful pandemic. For example, I run the estate strategy for Dorset Police and my estate strategy has been literally ripped up and we have to start again because we have nearly a third of the workforce now working at home as business as usual. Uh, Why would I need 13 buildings housing two and a half thousand people when I now have 500 people working at home. It stopped me buying buildings I was going to buy and it stopped me selling buildings I was going to sell. The whole estate strategy has changed. And somewhere like the Metropolitan Police, 25% of policing, they're going to have to completely change their footprint in the capital to uh, meet the changing workforce expectations because people aren't travelling. So, and of course, that does lead to the different crime types because people aren't traveling and people are staying at home. And I know Karen will talk about this later. You're a really rich target for phone fraud 
where people wouldn't, wouldn't normally be at home to answer the phone during the day. Now they are, and phone fraud is going up dramatically. So it, it's causing all sorts of behaviours, but certainly as police crime commissioner, the changing of the estate for, for policing and my footprint in the county I help police is is massive. Karen, you, you've got that unique perspective of having seen it in policing and, and now moving into a, a, a another sector and seeing this, uh, the, the vulnerability and some of the challenges. I wonder what your reflections are on what you've seen during the pandemic. For me, we started out um, the pandemic now probably about eight months ago, um, and the world just moved online. It was a seismic shift, not just in our work lives, our private lives. Everything moved online more or less overnight, and I think we adapted really well. Um, I think the things that it threw up at the time, um, and I think when I look at the pandemic, I look at it in three ways. I look at what did it do to us, the citizen? What did it do to the criminal? And what did it do to the space? And when I look at us, I think we all moved online. We moved quite well. We were quite resilient, uh, but there were risks. And when we moved there, there were risks physically and there were risks um, in the digital world. Uh, the infrastructure probably wasn't at that stage built. And, and I can remember the first days when we went online, there was so much pressure um, on the infrastructure and the broadband connections that it was really difficult to, to actually manage those systems. But we're up, we're running and it's good. Um, so we have adapted um, to that. I think the thing that has happened, what I see now is for eight months, we are now starting to see the emotional impact of people online living in isolation, second lockdown. And I think the emotional impact um, is something that perhaps we need to think a little bit more about, about people working from home. And, and how do we maintain that in terms of, you know, their well-being and stuff like that. So so if you look at us, um, I think the, the other aspect of it is, is that we want things and we need things and we're doing a lot of our shopping and our interaction online personally and pri in, in our private lives um, i'm doing most of my online shop i'm doing most of my christmas shopping online so is everybody else when we're doing all of that actually where's the fraudster looking he is online she is online and they're looking for our vulnerabilities so for everything we do the fraudster will look at us when i look at the fraudster and the criminal a couple of things they were really quick to adapt all crime, I think, um, outside of probably domestic violence um, and, and fraud literally went down. Um, fraud went down for only a matter of about two weeks and was back up to operating at the same levels. Fraudsters are particularly persuasive and they, they just exploded the situation. If you think what types of frauds happened, the first things that happened were people re being repatriated from other jurisdictions trying to get home. There were people selling f um, flights that didn't exist. There were people then um, uh, selling PPE, personal protection equipment. Um, it didn't exist. It was fraudulent. It was substandard. We actually saw fraudulent um, sales of pets. People were alone. They were vulnerable. They wanted something. People, there was a mass of um, fraud around selling pets. I heard recently the fraudulent selling of motorhomes, caravans, things that people wanted because they weren't going to be able to fly abroad and, and uh, take a holiday. So the fraudster is constantly horizon scanning and looking at what's the next thing that the, that the individual, the citizen like you and I, what do they want? And the fraudster steps right into that space and they effectively nearly, they, they groom us, they manipulate us and they exploit that need. And I think the third thing is about the space. The space in which we're living now is very different to where we were this time last year, Craig. We're in a space that is uncertain and there's a lot of fear. It's very complex. We're not sure what the next six months is going to ha bring with it. Um, our financial circumstances have changed and actually, you know, we're fearful financially for the future. So what's the next big fraud? We need to look at investments and where we might put our money in the future. The fraudster will also look there. And Karen, I wonder, with your perspective of having worked in the law enforcement sector and now being in a different sector, are you confident industry is doing all it can in that sector to help around this fraud issue? I think, you know, I've been quoted before because before I came to this side of the house and before I started to work with, with the banking and financial industry, um, I worked with a number of industries. And certainly, um, I, I think industry works to a degree with 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 policing um 
I think there is um, some breakdown between the public and the private sector around what what is shared and how it can be shared. And, and I think there's probably historic and cultural issues there. But what I have seen is, and certainly from the financial sector, and I saw this when I was in policing, the financial sector, banking in particular, has worked really closely with um with with law enforcement it doesn't pay for a bank to have fraud committed against it it doesn't pay because it it reduces profits it reduces trust for the customer and actually everybody loses so so it doesn't pay for banks to in any way um not be working with um law enforcement I think there's more that can be done cross sector. I think legislation probably needs to change to allow for better information sharing. I think we need to extend not just banking and finance. There's telcos, there's social media, there's the online harms bill. A lot of um, our communication today and particularly since COVID has been in that space. And I think more needs to happen around those um, platforms, around, you know, in respect of social media. So a good start working very hard to improve that, but it's a it's a much broader sector than just the, the financial industry. Thank you. Al, if I can turn to you, do, do you recognise much of the description and, and, and what does it look like from an industry perspective in, in terms of where you've got to uh, uh, and the changes in patterns of business you've seen uh, during this year? Uh, it does, actually. Uh, and in fact, it probably affected us even more. Um, so if I, if I look today... 80% of our workforce is working from home. And so, so Martin's points about infrastructure and, you know, our facilities plan, um, has also been decimated. Um, and of course, uh, you know, our program managers who, ind- who run individual programs pay for their seats in each building. So of course, and they're canny people. And so if they're people at home, they realize they can make a saving on their program. And, and then so the rest of us are left with a big building that's empty that we've got to pay for. So, so we're, we've all got the same problems. Um, and interestingly, we've adapted, um, very quickly, um, to, to working on, uh, you know, uh, online uh, almost exclusively. But it is interesting, um, at what Karen said about the emotional impact of it. And, and so a lot of our meetings now, we're starting to do things called check-ins. So prior to the meeting, we actually ask each of a you know, you normally go around the room introducing everybody, but we'd also then go around the room saying, right, what's distracting you at the moment from being present in the meeting? And it's surprising what people will say, whether it's, uh, well, I'm actually, I'm expecting a delivery because I'm buying everything online and I'm kind of looking to make sure I don't miss it. So you've got these different distractions that normally in a business sense, it would be sort of, you know, frowned upon, but now is becoming very accepting because you know you've got to get the job done you also know that people are under that pressure that emotional pressure the you know the the environment that can really really describe very well and so i think there is much more focus around leadership and you know you kind of take for granted that the tech's going to work in the background and so you actually up your comms up your leadership and up your engagement with your staff to try and keep them with you and and sort of replace the coffee bar water cooler effect of forming your team. Do you get the sense that's temporal uh, as in, you know, uh, you know, next year there'll be some normality that's back to normal? Or do you think some of these changes are, are going to be much more long term, this different nature of work? I think this was a catalyst for changes that were going to happen over a period of time. Um, and I, and I think some of them are really good changes. Um, but we also have to recognize that for some people, it just doesn't work. And so, so we've, we've actually taken quite a lot of time to identify those that it doesn't work for. And actually then where they've been given priority as we've opened a building back up, they've been given priority to go back into a building ahead of somebody who you might want in the building from an operational sense, but they don't need it from an emotional sense. And so we've actually put the emotional fitness of our staff ahead of the operational effect almost, as long as we can maintain our output. And and on the whole, you can. And so if we can accommodate that, we will. But what I think we're finding is that we will definitely have a reduced footprint. We've broken the, you need to be within this radius of of an office 
where myself and the new COO came on board in July, we were we were hired completely virtually. All the interviews were virtual. We've onboarded virtually. I've never met my team face to face, but I could easily see a, a, a 75% virtual, 25% in the workplace as being the norm. That's interesting, Karen. Because I, I think you you swapped in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the pandemic, so you've experienced uh, what Al describes the sort of new onboarding. What what's your take on it? I think there's a couple of things. It's not the way I would choose to do it, uh, but it's good that the technology and the infrastructure is there that I can do it. And um, so I, like Al has said there, I have not met my team physically. I have met my well. First of all, I'm recruiting. And um, the team that I do interact with, I've met them all online. And that is the extent of the relationship It and phone calls. I never thought I would say it, but I crave the people. I'm, I'm quite a systems thinker, but I am craving people. And I'm craving that interaction to really get to understand what I would call the small politics, the small P politics, the culture, the feel, and all of that part of the business, which is really important. Um, so... So I'm looking forward to to getting that in, in the new year and as we go forward. I absolutely agree with Al, though. Um, I think the, these are changes which were well overdue anyway. Um, and out of a crisis, I think, comes many good things um, if we put our mind to it. I don't think presenteeism was always a positive thing. I think this shows us that we can work from home. We don't need the traditional estate that Martin talked about. We can work in a different way. We can be closer to our families. We can be productive, but we do need also the office space. So the death of the office space for me is not a death. It's something here that will continue on. We need to make that connection with our professional, um, with the professionals that we work with. So it's, for me, it's a change. Um, it's a challenge. It's a great leveler as well, though, isn't it? Great leveler. Because yeah. It, it's, it, it really does because you, you move away from that sort of hierarchy and into, you know, pure engagement on a on a task based you know methodology and so so i think it's it also helps with i i think it's helped with our diversity and inclusion um how we roll that out and how we how we make sure we're accessing you know people who would normally not go for appointments we've had people promoted because they can now see that they can do the role because it's now virtual based whereas yeah. before they couldn't fit it in and and yeah. that's opened up a whole pool of talent that perhaps we wouldn't have pulled on before. And and Martin, that that picks up with something you touched on. You know, I'm interested in this. If we've got young people listening to to, to this podcast, what are those new group of skills? What are those new attributes? What are those new leadership styles? We've heard Al and Karen describe their experience. What do you think it looks like in policing? What do you want in the the, the Dorset PC for 2035. Yeah, uh, I ought to have a crystal ball really as to what, what it would look like because we don't, this journey hasn't finished yet. That's the interesting thing. We don't know where we're yeah. going to end up. Karen's quite right um, about the death of the uh, office, but actually we don't know what this is going to look like. Um, and uh, I always, I worry about youth actually because the double or triple dip recession we're going to have or we're going through leads to a fragile economy and, and the housing market. Uh, and our unemployment numbers are going to go up to something we haven't seen for a generation. So what does that mean? One, for civil unrest from a policing point of view. And what does that mean for our youth? Um, what is their future? Uh, we've got so many disaffected uh, teenagers and young adults at the moment over the university debacle. What is going to happen to them if they want to get a job now? And and here we have two out of our three panellists have been hired virtually. It, it is a different world that we're growing up in. And my worry from a policing point of view is mental health. I have to talk about mental health. Um, we know that people crave social and human interaction. Working at home permanently cannot be good for our mental well-being. Uh, and it's a real issue for policing. We know that during the first lockdown from the survey, we have just got back from all police forces, that there was a 50% increase in mental health referrals and policing incidents during the first lockdown. And that demand is still there. And we have a population now that's working at home is COVID fatigued and their mental well-being is suffering. And with that, how will police and other agencies cope in what we now call the new normal? So it remains to be seen for me, but 
and I have to I have to say it's a but we have to worry about um, mental crisis increases and suicide increases. Sadly, we're already seeing yeah. an increase in male suicide. Uh, and how is society? Although we've adapt really well, and Al said he slotted straight into uh, remote working with IT really easily. A lot of people haven't with their mental well being. And how are we going to deal with that as a society and as a police force? And, and you, you touched on the, the well-being. I just want to pick as well, the, the, the well-being of sort of the, if you like, the well-being of the organisation. How, how do you how do you keep yourself uh, uh, abreast of that one? You know, I, I mean, a number of you have used this phrase of, of um, fatigue, and there is almost a, a societal fatigue at the moment for understandable reasons, uh, uh, given what we're going through. How, how do you keep a, uh, something as crucial as policing motivated, safe, secure, um, when we're asking all these demands of them. And, that, and that's even harder for some of the uh, workforce who are never coming to work. So um, Al, Al yeah. talked about the 75 25%. In policing, it's more like 20%, 60%, 20%. So you have your 20% permanently at home who are mainly back office, police officer and police staff. Then you have your 60% in the middle who are very, very fluid, one day they'll be at work, one day they'll be at home. And then you've got your 20%, like your police officers, your PCSOs and your CSIs, who will always be on the cold face at work. It's the 60% in the middle and the 20% working at home permanently that I worry about because they they have yeah. got to be watched from a well-being point of view. And certainly in Dorset, I can't speak for other police forces, we've increased our support, we've increased, we've hired new staff to deal with the well-being of, of, the, of the workforce because we realise it's going to be really tough out there. And it already is, actually. We're, you know, we're talking as if this is new. We're nine months in and it's affecting people's well-being. Karen, are you seeing those same challenges around well-being? You know, we have these conversations every day around how we, I think Al talked about it, it's task, it's task orientated engagement, which doesn't feel comfortable, doesn't feel natural. So, you know, we live our days through Zoom meetings, but those Zoom meetings are very much um, around a, a subject matter and we don't do the around the edges conversation. So you go to a meeting normally and you cover off four or five pieces of business because you have all those extraneous conversations. I think we also don't get the energy and, and people have, have said this, you know, I think we spoke about a COVID fatigue. Um, so we're not getting yeah. the energy of other people, other people's ideas. We're not getting that energetic coming together of minds thinking similarly and thinking differently and actually coming upon solutions. So, so that innovation space, um, I, I think has, has probably, um, in some respects, maybe been hurt a little bit because that the speed by which you can get some innovative solutions isn't isn't quite there and um, so so i think the private sector um are, are seeing that in exactly the same way as, as the public sector i think in some ways the private sector are probably able to work from home in a way because policing is a 24 7 we need to be there in the middle of the night when people call for help and um, probably in some respects the public sector maybe not so physically present, but online still very, very demanding. And certainly in financial sector, the whole economic uncertainty of the future is something that we are working very hard around. So, yeah, I mean, similar, slightly different, but all the issues you talk about are, are there. Yeah. And, and Al, that future skills piece, you know, if if you're sitting there in Lidos now, what are, what are the skills you want over the next three to five years Um uh, for the people you're sort of recruiting and bringing into the business? So um, our, our focus really is in two areas. It's really, um, we're, we're just investing in um, building a software factory, um, which actually is split between Farnborough and uh, Glasgow. Um, and the concept there is that, you know, tasks of work go in and you form a team around a particular task. Um, they, they then, you know, produce the software very quickly and then you deploy it, um, or you take somebody's legacy application, you you wrap it in a sort of co infrastructure as code, which you then deploy on the cloud. So a lot of the things that you might well go on the digital journey for, you know, a police from legacy to digital, yeah, we're doing right now. That doesn't sit well with with a, a pandemic because you want to form those teams, and mm. so. 
we're, we're actually doing it virtually at the moment. Um, the building's just been finished and it's literally brand spanking new and sat there not occupied. We think that will get occupied again. Um, and the other area is our cyber operations. So exactly what Karen said about the fraudster, we've always looked at how we protect our infrastructure, how we protect our programs, how we protect our customers. Um, but the pace of make, keeping up with that has definitely increased. And so cyber skill sets are something that we are definitely investing in at the moment and tra- and starting to think about how we retrain people where where with the changes, you want to retrain them so that they can do things like that from home, for instance. So it's, it's changing the way we work. It's changing... Um, the types of skills that we're hiring, uh, and we're definitely hiring, um, and so, so and and overcoming the how do you actually assess people f- from purely online without doing face to face meetings? How do you test their skills, etc.? You know, and all of those little challenges about you know how do you onboard somebody um, and get them working productively without having that face to face contact from the get go. And the answer is back to what I said before. It's all about comms and and really keeping keeping that drumbeat up of of the incidental conversations that you're missing from the task orientated ones. Martin, yeah, I, I was just going to come in on what Al said because um, I, I know I always sound like the voice of doom, but um, that when you when you talk about you, <laughs> I mean, let's just think about that. Let's just drill down into that. How do you have a police cadet scheme? when you can't meet face to face? And even more importantly, how can you have police apprenticeships or how can you have apprenticeships period uh, for young people to learn the trade from another expert practitioner when all you can do is virtual? I mean, it really is a depressing landscape for our youth. And um, everywhere they look, whether it's to university, whether it's to apprenticeships, whether it's to employment, it, it is very bleak, and I, I, I think we are going to have to change the skill set of our youngsters very quickly. Exactly what I was saying. And and do you get a sense that in your conversations at a sort of Dorset wide level, um, people other other people see that landscape in that way? So educationalists and others, the universities are ready to gear up for a new different different world. Yeah, I do see that. And uh, I speak, I'm in, I lecture at the university, I'm a visiting fellow. So um, the university has, has a, a built up a very quickly an online presence uh, and students have adapted to it. But that is different to learning a profession, which is what Al was talking yeah. about. And then the other angle, Craig, that you and I talk about a lot is assertive localism. How will Dorset as a county or any other county in this beautiful country, how will that change in response to COVIDness? So, for example, we know that during the first lockdown, the public lands tuned into local community. Local radio stations received a huge boom of listeners and everybody started looking in their 10, 15 mile radius instead of looking to London or Manchester. Um, And that means that farm shops, small traders, small towns experienced a huge boom when the town centres were ghost towns. But will that carry on? Will we see a resurgence of rural market towns? If we do, that could be the saviour of youth. If we don't, I do worry about where youth is going to go for employment uh, because you can't do it all yeah. online. You can't learn a trade online. And of course, if we do go back to rural market town footprints, where does policing fit into that? It's an interesting one. And, and, and I suppose that's this unique nature of policing as a public service, which... You know, it it always talked about from local to global uh, and certainly local to national. To some extent, this this reinforces that. Karen, I wonder if you had a view. I mean, you you fraud is one of those things that touched at a very very local level. The person next door, your own home, that sort of thing, but is often perpetrated at a national or international level. It, is that reach still appropriate? I, I think. <laughs> I, I always looked at, um, I, I suppose I look at economic crime in three levels, the international, well, probably four levels, the international, the national, the regional and the local. And and I think um, the activities in each of those areas, so the volume and the impact and, you know, the harm largely sits at that local level. Um, but the ability to really make an impact and to... Um, to target your uh, main suspects, 
definitely sits at a regional, national and, and even an international level. Um, when we look at the international side of things, it's it's not just international policing, it's international policing and banking and telcos. So there is a much broader infrastructure um, that we need to tap into and find ways of working through um, that then protects the, the person on the uh, at that very local level. So for me, and the distance, I used to talk about the continuum of offending and and there are there are different parts between that local to regional to national and international that we need to really understand where can we make the interventions how can we get in ahead of the risk if we're going to invest money and that would be a really difficult conversation going forwards where do we invest that money um and and where are we going to get the biggest bang for our buck and i think policing will be faced with those massively difficult conversations going forward um I left them having the conversations. I, I know those conversations continue and, and I don't think it's, it's one or the other. I, I think it's different approaches at necess- you know, potentially at a local level about how we respond and support victims. And I think it's, it's a different than approach when we look about targeting suspects and, and what do we do with our partners and other stakeholders? I think we have to start to work more broadly. I, I suppose it's it, it it probably falls on me to to sort of pull this together uh, in in terms of the uh, uh, the event, but I suppose there's one question sort of I'm left with: if you could all go back nine months and sort of think, what is the thing you really wish you knew that you knew now that's made a real difference to the business, the service, service to the public? Martin, from your perspective, what's what's that one thing you you know with hindsight you'd love to have known? Uh, as someone who steered um, a county through COVID and been honoured to have done so, actually, I think it's the police relationship with the public. If I could look back, I would do things slightly differently. I worry about the relationship with the public over the, over the role of policing in enforcing COVID regulations. Um, never forgetting we're a society that polices by consent. Uh, and actually the 90% non-payment of COVID fixed penalty tickets nationally is a stark reminder that some sections of the public are fiercely opposed to COVID rules and enforcement. And I do worry about civil unrest if the pandemic continues unabated. Uh, and this pandemic, I have to say, takes me back to the 80s and the miners' strike in that policing is being expected to enforce not just the rule of law, but also the rule of the government. For example, the current ban on public protests is a purely political decision that some senior leaders disagree with, including me. But police leaders have to enforce it because it's now law. And as soon as policing starts enforcing the will of government rather than the law of the government, I worry about uh, civil unrest. I'd, and I think if I could have gone back, myself, the Chief Constable and the MPs would have dealt slightly differently with the enforcement in the first lockdown. That's really interesting. Uh, there's, a, there's a bit of a theme there about community confidence in all its forms, sitting at the heart of a lot of what we've discussed this afternoon. Karen, from your perspective, sort of um, the, the look back, what what would you like to have known? There are challenges. Um, it's not easy. There are legislative challenges. Um, there are data sharing challenges. It feels remarkably similar in ways. Um, so, you know, the public to private um, relationship is not massively dissimilar to the private to private relationships. And I think one key thing is about technical solutions. So way back, seven, eight months ago, I was um, frustrated. I would have been somewhat, um, yeah, definitely frustrated around where are the technical solutions that can deliver some of this. And, and I hear that, oh, we can have technical solutions, but I couldn't actually find the technical solutions and I couldn't find just the thing that was going to deliver it. Um, and now that I'm in the private sector, I look and I think I'm still looking for those technical s- solutions. So for me, it's not an answer as such that I can say to you, this is where we need to go. But I think what it confirms to me is what I believed and suspected were, were, were the problems. And I think one of the big problems is we have a technical gap um, around what solution we can do. And, and if I was to ask for one thing, knowing then and knowing now, it is, can we technically get a solution that glues together four or five databases, four or five systems that allows them to talk to each other and exchange that data quickly, efficiently and safely. And 
And if there's somebody out there that has that, please, <laughs> please, let's get in this space, Craig. Yeah. Here's your email. <laughs> well, it, it's probably an appropriate time to, 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 to hand it to, to, to Al. But Al, I, I wondered, you know, because you, you've got the unique perspective as well of, of coming into a new organisation as well. So you'll have it, it, interested in, you know, what would you have liked to know nine months ago? Uh, well, I would have liked to have started the job nine months ago rather than, <laughs> rather than when I did. Um, but because that would have made it a little bit easier. Um, uh, but actually, surprisingly, not much, to be honest, because I think uh, we as a company have really adapted very well to it. Um, the workforce have risen to the challenge. Our systems uh, that operate across many different databases and and come up with you know answers so so i do think those those solutions are there karen um and and we've supported our customers and i don't think we've missed a beat with any of our customers be that home office ministry of defense or or you know other customers that you know perhaps we wouldn't talk about but i don't think we missed a beat with them at all um i think we have accelerated things through so i think we've used it as a catalyst and and we've actually used it to drive change in the organization so so actually for us i think it's been quite positive about changing a legacy culture into a new culture um but to martin's point i do worry about the the you know young that we're bringing on board and and how we make sure that they are fully engaged and they get that, you know, the osmosis learning is missing. And so how we replicate that in a virtual world. Thank you, everyone. Uh, fantastic contributions in terms of that. Some of those key themes from how we bring people on board, what are the skills we require for the future, what does digital look like, and some of the threats uh, we're being lined up to to tackle uh, will feature as part of the digital summit but but thank you very much for the contributions um always good as usual to talk to you